If you would remain standing for the reading of God's word in Luke chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. You guys can have a seat. Let me say a brief prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, preaching your word is it's a natural thing. And I and we are dependent on you doing a supernatural thing and making it effective today. I pray that the people leave here today, not just hearing the voice of a mere man, but hearing your very voice to them. I pray that we would see Christ's love greater than we've ever seen it before. And I pray that we would see why he is so worthy of us giving our entire lives to. And we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, happy Easter to you guys. I know that Jordan greeted you guys and maybe somebody coming in, but I wanted to do that. My name is uh, R.C. Ford and I'm the campus pastor here. And uh, I am excited about being here with you today on Easter, Resurrection Day, all of those things. And um, I love all of the, the traditions that kind of surround Easter. I don't know if you do, but... Um, I, I love them. I love that. I love coming in on uh, this day. Uh, again, all Lord, Lord's days are great, but this day's just special. You come in here and everybody just kind of maybe gets prepared a little bit different today. Some people actually brush their hair and brush their teeth for church and, uh, and, and get, get a little more jacket game going on, right? I, like me, myself today. Um, I've got to get this thing going because I got a valet gig I got to pick up later today, but um, you, uh, you, you, it's just different today. There's traditions surrounding it. Maybe you got family in town today and you got big lunch plans and you're doing all those things. And, and then of course, one of the most favorite Chris, or I'm sorry, I almost said Christmas Easter traditions that we have is when we unleash the kids out into the yard to play hunger games for eggs. And, uh, I was at one yesterday and uh, I saw that firsthand, it can get violent. And so, uh, but I love those things about Easter. Uh, they're great. Uh, but of course, that's not why we're here today. We're not here because of those things. And we're not here because a bunny showed up. We're here because Jesus showed out. We're here because the most important event in human history has happened, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. And so today, this message is titled, Death to Life. Death to Life. That's what I want you to focus on today. And so before we get started, um, I wanted to share with you a story that I read about this week. And it's a story of a fifth grade elementary school teacher. And she had assigned a project to all of her students. And the assignment was, I need you to go home, do a little bit of research, And I want you to come back and tell us a story that has a a life lesson at the end of it, kind of a 
moral of the story kind of thing. And so the, she sent the students out, they go, they come back the next day, and one by one, they begin to share their stories. The first child stood up and he wanted to tell the story of the tortoise and the hare. And of course, the, the moral of the story was slow and steady wins the race. Uh, another young man stood up and he wanted to tell the story of the boy who cried wolf. And of course, the moral of the story is wolves eat liars. That's kind of how that goes. Uh, another young lady stood up and, and she wanted to share uh, about the story about the farmer and the chickens. And her, her lessons coming out of that was you don't put all your eggs in one basket and you don't count your chickens before they hatch. And so these are some moral of the story things. You're, you get it. You understand what's happening. But there was this one boy who raised his hand. And the teacher looked at him and said, Johnny, do you, do you have a story that you would like to share? And he said, yes, ma'am, I do. Uh, my, my daddy told me a story about my crazy Aunt Karen. And Aunt Karen, um, Aunt Karen was a pilot in the, uh, the, the war, the desert storm. She was a pilot and she was in flight and she was uh, hit by enemy fire and was going down an enemy territory. So Aunt Karen she grabs a machine gun, she grabs a, a parachute on her back, a machine gun, and a machete, and she chugs a fifth of whiskey and then jumps out of the plane, lands on the ground surrounded by a hundred enemies. And Aunt Karen took her machine gun and she mowed down 70. She, 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 after she ran out of bullets, she grabbed a machete and she took out another 20 until the blade was bent. She tossed it to the ground and she finished off the last 10 with her bare bloody hands. Now you can imagine the teacher in the middle of this, right? He's like, oh, Johnny, what, what, what possible lesson, what moral could be learned from this horrible story? And Johnny said, you don't mess with Aunt Karen when she's been drinking. <laughs> you might be asking yourself right now, what in the world does that have to do with Easter? Really, it doesn't. Uh, it was funny. I thought it was a funny story. Uh, but, but in reality, there is a reason why I tell you that story. Because today, as we tell the story, the old, timeless, familiar story of the resurrection of Jesus... I believe that the moral of the story is death to life. We know the story is about the, uh, the death of Jesus uh, and, and being raised to life. So D Jesus went from death to life. However, it's not just for Jesus, it's for us. It's for you and for me and for all people who believe in Jesus. We are also raised from death to life. And so this message is for everybody in the room, preacher included. There's a lot of spiritual diversity in the room. We're all over the place. And so this message of death to life is for the believer today who is potentially being threatened by the thief of familiarity, who just wants to take away the awe and the wonder of the resurrection. You've seen it, you've done it a bunch of times, and no, let's just go through another one. Like, you need this. We need this. This story, this message is also for um, a believer who maybe has, has forgotten what Jesus Christ has done on their behalf. And so their relationship or their love with Jesus has gone a little bit lukewarm. Maybe they've been away from Jesus' bride, the church, a long time. They've been away or astray. And so this message today of death to life is for you. This message of death to life is for the people here who they believe in Jesus, but yet there's, a, there's still an area of their life that they're clinging to. They've not fully given that over to Jesus. This message is for you. This message is for someone here who might be curious. Message is for someone here who is begrudgingly here because someone guilted you into being here. And you're just trying to keep the peace. Sure, I'll go to church, whatever. Message is for you today. This message is for anyone here who might be trying to build a religious resume 
just in case there's a God one day and you have to face it. And you could say, hey, 2023, I was at Easter at Light Point Church. This message, no matter where you are today spiritually, this message is for you, this message is for me. And the good news of this message is this. The good news of the message is that the tomb is empty, Jesus is risen, and because of that, there is life in Christ for all of us. And so, spoiler alert at our church, I'm going to try to convince you for the next 30, 35 minutes or so of why that you should give your life to Christ and that you would find life in him today and he would raise you from death to life. So let's look at these three things in our passage today. The first thing I want us to see is that the tomb is empty and this is in verses one through three. Let's read it again. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So it's the first day of the week. It's early in the morning. It's probably still dark outside. And we're told that these women went to the tomb. Now, in verse 10, we're, we're, we're given the identity of the women, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, the mother of James, and also Joanna. Uh, and the gr- this group of women, they got up really early and they went to the tomb And they were going down to the tomb because they were uh, going to anoint the body of Jesus. They had spices. So these women went to the tomb with spices. You could probably say they were original Spice Girls. All right, you could say that. Dad joke. So they get there. They get there. Now, I I think it's important to see that right before this passage, these women had just witnessed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they already did this. They had already taken the body of the Lord Jesus down. They had already cleaned him up. They had already uh, anointed him with these spices. They had prepared his body like, a, like putting dry rub on a rack of ribs. They've already done this process and they folded the linens and covered him up. They had already done all of this. And yet now the women, after watching the men do this, now say, we need to go do this. Now, I don't know if you're tracking or not, but can, can, you, can you identify at all with this men and women in the room? <laughs> men, this, is, this might be like, I know this is like when my wife, she says, hey, can you help with the dishes? Can you, can you do the laundry around the house? And so you, you do those things. You're like trying to please your wife. You're doing all these things. You're brushing the kid's hair before church. You're putting her clothes on them. You're doing all these things and you think you're killing it, right, guys? You're like, man, I'm just knocking this out. And then your wife comes along and she says, oh, that's so sweet. Bless your heart. (laughs) Just go sit down. Take it easy. Let me do it right, right? That's kind of what's happening here when these ladies kind of take over to redo something that these men had done. And when they get there, though, when they arrive, we're told that they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This is why we are here today. This is why we're here today. Not because your kid's Easter basket is full, but because the tomb is empty. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cradle of Jesus at his birth and the cross at his death mean absolutely nothing without the resurrection. The resurrection is everything. It's the foundation of our faith. It is the hinge of our hope. The resurrection split time in the universe from AD, BC, BC, AD. It just, it literally separates the world all because of this one man and his empty tomb. And you have to, you have to consider, we have to consider that no other mortal man or no other woman on the face of the earth in the entire history has ever been celebrated every single year. Seasons dedicated to them. For 2,000 years, this has been going on. In a few months, 
We're going to go into the Christmas season and we'll celebrate this man's birth and we'll do it again next year until the Lord returns. Why? Why is this one so different in all of human history? It is because this man's tomb is empty. Everything rests upon the empty tomb. But the empty tomb by itself is an empty message. It doesn't stop there. The empty tomb means that Jesus is risen. And let's look at that in verses four through seven. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. So as these women are on the outside of the tomb and they're watching and they're, they're, they're picking up their jaws which had dropped to the ground in shock and awe, these two angels appear in their Easter best like you today in bedazzling apparel. And they, they come up to these women and they ask them a very, very important question, not only to them, but to us as well today. And they ask the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? Another way to frame that would be, why do you seek a living Jesus in dead places? Now, that's the question that the angels ask the women, but what is the question that the angels ask us today? Here's the question. Why do you seek life in dead places? Why do you look for life in things that won't give you life? And that is, I believe, a pressing question in our world today. You see, we all stand on common ground in here, and here's the common ground. We all know that this world, the people in this world, are more depressed, stressed out, and messed up ever before. No one in the room disagrees with that. And so here's what we do. We're like little kids questing for eggs in the yard. We're on this quest to try to look for life. We're we're constantly running around looking for meaning, for purpose, for hope, for security, for satisfaction that lasts. We're all questing for life somewhere. We're all doing it. God has designed us that way. But many today are practically doing the same thing as these women, looking for life in dead places, tombs. There's no life in them. Some people are looking for life in making a lot of money, maybe medicine, maybe material things. Maybe that will give me life. Some people are looking for life in stuff, status, sex. People are looking for life in those Things. Some are looking for life in liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and some are even looking for life in political tombs. Meaning, you just think, if we could just get the world right, and if the conservatives could just take back the world and own the libs, everything will be great in the world. And looking for life in political tombs, I want those things too, but I know life's not found there. Some people are looking for life and climbing the corporate ladder, building buildings, owning properties and condos and dream houses with picket fences. Others are looking for life and academic success. Got to make the dean's list. Got to get the scholarship. I got to get the degree, the doctorate, the master's. Then I will find life. Some are looking for 
life in accumulating followers and likes on social media. What slavery that is. If I could just get enough followers, if people would just start liking my post, then maybe one day I can become a social media influencer and not have to work ever in my life. This is life. I I think I can find life there. Some people think they can. Some people think life is found in chasing trophies on the weekends with their kids, spending Friday through Sundays at the lakes, taking great vacations, eating, drinking, being merry, falling in love, getting married, working, retiring early, then maybe having some grandchildren and just coasting through the golden years all the way to eternity. Some people are actually looking for life in those things. And so I want you to know something. Those are all tombs. You will never, ever find life in those things or those places. They're not inherently wrong, but you'll never find life there because God is not the foundation of those things. They're gifts from God, but they aren't God. Does that make sense? Looking for life in those places will leave you in this life discontent, unsatisfied, lost, lonely, hopeless, a breathing death of existence in this life, and then it leads to the condemnation of your soul for eternity in the next. Because life is not found in dead places. Life is only found in the source of life. Life is only found in Jesus. Life is only found in Jesus. Maybe today you're here and you're, you're kind of like right now, you're kind of saying, I'm, I'm curious. I'll listen to this guy a few more minutes. Maybe you're here and, and you might be saying to yourself right now, this is actually starting to make sense. Like now, that's why I feel lost. It's why I feel hopeless. It's why I'm so depressed all the time. It's why nothing ever seems to work out. Nothing ever seems to last. It, like, is this it? Like, is this the problem with my life? I hope that you see that God might be wooing you to himself, showing you that life is not ever going to be found in dead places. The tra- Let me transition back to the text here. The ladies, they, they were shocked, right? But they weren't the only ones shocked here in the story. I think the angels were actually shocked at the response of the women too. Uh, look what they said again. They said, um, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise? The angels are like, don't you remember what he said? Like, were you napping during the sermon or were you just dreaming about where you're gonna go to lunch during the sermon when Jesus was talking? He said it three times. He told you what was gonna go down. He's going to be crucified on a cross and rise on the third day. Plus, you saw the miracles. You were there, ladies. You just had dinner with a dead man who wasn't dead anymore. His name is Lazarus. These ladies were around Jesus, heard Jesus, saw Jesus, spent time with Jesus, and yet they missed Jesus. And I think this is an important lesson for us today. It's not just for a lesson about Jewish women This is a lesson of us and how easy it is to forget. How easy it is for us to to miss Jesus. Like it's an entirely possible reality. We have to agree with this. That if you come here today and we know how to dress, we we know how to dress in our Easter best, we know that the pastor man is going to give three points in the sermon about the empty tomb and the resurrection. It's possible for you to miss the main thing today. What is the main thing today? According to verse seven, that the perfect son of God, Jesus Christ, was delivered into the hands of sinful men. 
is crucified on a cross that was reserved for you and for me. And he was raised to life on the third day. That's the main thing. And because the tomb is empty and Jesus is risen, now you and I can find life in a risen Christ. Let's look at the last point. There's life in Christ. Life in Christ is our last point here. Let's read this in verse 8 through 12. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to all of the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to be them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. I love how this passage ends here. After the angels give a kind of a soft rebuke to the women and then kind of redirects them back to the truths, then they remembered. They remembered, and they, after remembering, they ran home and began to tell all of the apostles what they had just witnessed. Jesus is not there. He's not in the tomb. And what did they, what does the text say? So the text said they didn't believe them. They didn't believe the women. They probably thought they had huffed too many spices. They thought it was an idle tale. But not Peter. Not Peter. Peter rose and ran to the empty tomb and he, he stooped in. He just kind of stooped in, began to look around for himself. He saw the linen cloths neatly folded up because Jesus always did the right thing. So he folded his linens, right? Where, where Jesus' body had been laying, he's sitting there, just the linen cloths, and, and he saw that the tomb was empty. Put yourself in, in Peter's sandals for a moment. I, I, this is not in the text, but I like to sometimes think about, okay, what, what's really going on in this moment? I use my imaginations, and it's good for us to do that. He's looking in. Jesus is gone. And he's probably in that moment recalling every single miracle that he'd ever seen Jesus do. And all of them are just being amplified. Oh, that's what you were doing. Oh, you're so much more than I ever thought. Now I get it. Now it makes sense. He's probably thinking and recalling what had just happened days prior where his Lord and his Savior was arrested, spit on, mocked, beaten, tortured, killed on a bloody cross. He's probably filled with unimaginable shame because he denied Jesus three times. He's probably got tears going down his face. But as he looks in at the empty tomb, I think he probably wipes his tears away. Why? Because the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. He's really not dead. He is alive. And in that moment, I believe Peter knew that all of his past sins had been forgiven, that his present had purpose and his future was secure. I believe in that moment, Peter realized that he had gone from death to life because of what Jesus did. And he left the tomb marveling, we're told. He left the tomb marveling, shouting about the resurrection. We know how it ended for Peter. Shouting about the resurrection eventually led to his death. But he saw a risen Christ. He, he saw the empty tomb. He believed and he shouted about the resurrection. He wasn't silent about the resurrection. He shouted about the resurrection. I heard a story about a, a British pastor who had a congregation uh, around the 1950s. A faithful gospel preacher. Um, he had been at the same church for a very long time. Not a celebrity pastor and, hopping around churches for platforms. But a guy who was faithful to one church 
and preaching the gospel day in, day out, week in and week out for a very, very long time. As he aged, he developed a condition called muscular dystrophy, and you know what that does to the body. It begins to wear his body down. And in his latter years, right before an Easter service on Sunday, he had prayed that the Lord would grant him one more sermon on the resurrection. Lord, keep me in the fight. Give me the strength to preach your gospel today. He woke up on Easter morning. He had lost his voice. He lost his voice. Couldn't speak, couldn't preach that day. But he did write a letter to his daughter that day. And the letter reads this. It's a terrible thing to have no voice on Easter Sunday with which to shout, he is risen. But a far, far worse thing to have a voice and not shout, he is risen. Can you shout? Like when we said he is risen earlier, can you really shout that with confidence? I hope that you do. I really do. You shout about the resurrection with your life. Peter dedicated his, the rest of his life to shouting about the resurrection of Christ. And here's the deal. The tomb is still empty. The tomb is still empty. And that, that stone that was rolled away at the tomb, the stone wasn't rolled away just so Jesus could get out. Stone was rolled away so that you and me could look in and believe. That we could look in, that we could believe that Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty, and that we could find life in Christ today. We could find life in Christ today. Now, I'm going to wrap this up, which is really the pastor's way of saying it's about 10 more minutes, right? If, if you haven't listened to anything that I've said today, uh, give, me, give me five, six minutes right now. This could be the most important thing that you hear today. And so what I want you to see and what I want you to hear, at Life Point Church, one of our mantras, our DNA, our lifeblood is find life. You'll see it on, on graphics and print material um, and just different things, uh, swag and all that stuff. Find life. And I want to tell you today where you can find life. But I think it's important before I tell you where to find life, I think it's important for us to define life. That's a vague term, right? What definition are you talking about when you're talking about life? You're talking about the time between my birth and my death? No, I'm not talking about that life. I'm not talking about like Spock theology, live long and prosper. I'm not talking about that life. I'm not talking about the, the mantra of the world today, living my best life now. I'm not talking about that Oprah, Oprahology stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about life. What is the definition of life according to God? Life is God. And God is life. You and I were created to know God, to enjoy God, and to reflect God on the earth. That is why he made us. That is the meaning of our existence, the purpose of why we breathe. It's to know God, to enjoy God, to reflect God. But if you know your Bible or any kind of story of what happened in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve fell, the world fell, and we fell with it. God says that we are born spiritually dead in spiritual tombs with a sin nature and we love to practice sin. 
We have a proclivity to do what's wrong, not right. Look at little children and you'll see that quickly. It's in our nature to do so. And it is the result of sin. And because we're spiritually dead, we look for life in created things instead of the creator. All those things I mentioned to you earlier, we're just kind of looking around, created things instead of the creator. We we'll never find them. We're chasing the wind, climbing a rope of sand. We'll never get a hold of it because the things are not God. God alone is the only one that can satisfy the longings of our souls. He's the only one that can fill the God-sized hole inside of us to give us purpose and meaning, a reason to get up every single day. Unconditional love. He's the only one. Hope. He's the only one that can give us those things. He's the only one that can give us true life. So, in God, sending his one and only son, Jesus Christ, God sent God to rescue us from God. He sent Jesus Christ to live the life we can't live, died the death that we deserve, and sent Jesus Christ to be resurrected from the dead so that you and I could find life again with our creator and our maker. Life is only found in Jesus. Look at John 10.10, 10, a couple of familiar passages. The thief, that is Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John eleven twenty five 25 through 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I hope that you do. Believe that you do. Do you believe this? How do you find life then? We've defined what life is. Life is in God. We don't have God. So how do we find life? We find life through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. His person, his work, not our works, lest we boast. It's just by confessing that he is Savior, that he, he is Lord, and having faith in what he has done. That's the only way we find life. It's just Jesus and only Jesus. But I'm going to do something different today because I think you've seen this before. You're like, okay, here it comes. Pray the prayer. If you just confess with your mouth that he is Lord, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that is true, by the way. Romans 10, that's true. We can, our profession of faith, meaning we truly do believe, we can be raised from the dead to life in Christ. But I want to show you something. Lest any of us think that we can just give Jesus a prayer or just give Jesus our hearts and be good. You know, there's something else that Jesus requires of us in order for us to find life. Something else that he says in Matthew 10 that is absolutely sobering and it's celebratory. Let's look at this in John or Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And here it is. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you know what Jesus just said to us? He said that if we are going to find life, that we have to lose our life first. This is the great paradox of Christianity, I think. Death 
leads to life. Surrender leads to victory. Loss leads to gain. The only way that you and I can find life is by losing our lives. You see, we naturally are life lovers. We love, we love us some self and we love us some life. And Jesus says, the only way that you could ever find life in me is by dying to yourself. You're gonna need to die. Why, why does Jesus tell us we're gonna have to die in order to find this life? Because we're in the way of eternal life. Our pride, our rebellion, our independence, our way, our, us, 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 we are actually in the way of finding life. So in order for us to find it, we must die. We must lose our lives. But the promise is this. For those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel, you gain life. You find life. You find true meaning, true purpose, true hope, true love, and eternal life with God forever. And that is our greatest need. In order to find life, you must lose your life. And that's a high challenge, isn't it? It's a high reward too. By grace and grace alone, we can lose our life and find life in Christ today. So how we're gonna respond, remember earlier I said that this message is for everyone, so I wanna give space for everyone to do something including myself. Um, and, and so if we have deacons in the room, I'm going I'm to ask you to make yourself available for um, anyone to come up and pray or talk or do anything. If, if there are any in the room, could somebody come up front, maybe two? And so here's what I want to do. I want to put Matthew 10, 39 back up on the screens. And the reason I want to do that is because these are not just words on a screen. This is the very voice of God inviting you today to lose your life so that you could find life. So I want this to just kind of be over us during the response time, looking at it, listening to me, but looking at it and, and processing what that actually means. And so we all have a response today. The first thing is, is, is some of you, you, for the very first time in your life, you need to find life in Christ. Not find life in church or going to church or dressing up for church or doing some religious things, but actually find life in giving your life to Jesus. And so you have an opportunity to get up today and make that decision. Uh, another potential is there's some people in the room here that might be depending on the prayer they prayed as a young child. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I don't need to do this. He's not talking to me right now. I prayed a prayer when I went to camp or VBS. I, I'm good, I don't wanna do that. Maybe you did, but has your life changed because of that prayer? Has your life been given to Jesus? Today, you might receive life for the very first time in your life. So you might want to come up and do that. To the believers that are in the room today, this time of response is, I want to ask you to do like Peter and ponder the empty tomb. Just, just ponder it with your imaginations and be reminded that your past has been forgiven, your present has purpose, and your future is secure. For the believer, I want you to move from pondering to praying for those that are in the room that might need to find life in Christ today. Might be someone you're sitting next to. Some of you are believers and you, you have life in Christ, but you have gone astray. Your relationship with Jesus has been lukewarm at best. 
you're not really in love with Jesus and you're not really in love with this church. You've kind of, you kind of have one foot in the grave. That old life you're still trying to cling on to. Ah, oh, yeah, I love the Jesus thing. I go to Easter, but God, I love my life so much. And I want to do what everybody else is doing. Today, the invitation is for you to get your foot out of the grave and walk in the newness of life. Recommit your life to Christ today. And when you come to him, no excuses necessary. Grace, open arms. I want to give you just a few minutes to... Some of you might bow your heads in prayer. Others might need to meditate on the passage on the screen. I wanna just give you just a few minutes. Let the Lord move you. I'm not gonna sit up here and manipulate for five minutes and play six songs to get you to move. We don't do that at our church. We trust God to move people. So I'm gonna shut up and I'm gonna let God move people. If he moves you, you get up and you move. Father, I thank you for allowing me to preach another Resurrection Sunday. And God, I know that my preaching is is done. It's concluded. But Father, you are the great preacher. So I pray that you fix everything that I've said that would be wrong today. You would continue to preach your sermon to your people and call people to yourself well beyond today. Father, again, we thank you for the empty tomb that your son Jesus Christ rose from the dead and we can have life in him. So we pray our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen.